For 400 million years, every top predator has needed the same fearsome piece of equipment, a wicked set of jaws. Out of life's endless struggle, predators evolve, defenses evolve in response, and ferocious top predators evolve again. It's a vicious story of kill and be killed, of escape and capture, the story of Jaws. powerful set of jaws today belongs to the Crocodilia order, which includes crocodiles and alligators. Their fearsome bite snaps shut with 3,000 pounds of bite force power. On the 1 8 inch point of the sharpest front tooth, 24,000 pounds per square inch, twice as much power as the average nail gun. The crocodile can feed on animals as large as water buffalo and wildebeest. For millions of years, crocodiles and every creature with a powerful jaw has held a huge advantage in the struggle for survival. The presence of a jaw changes the playing field altogether. What it means is that you're not limited to feeding on things that already fit in your mouth. Such a, a great asset that the vertebrates with jaws outcompeted everything else. In the history of the vertebrates, there's probably nothing quite as important as the evolution of a jaw. Jaws are everywhere. But once there were no jaws at all. How could one anatomical feature, a simple muscled hinge, drive so much of evolution, literally shaping many animals we see today? The answers begin with the first bite. In 1979, these fossils were identified as evidence of the world's first known jaws attack. This is the first bite mark produced by a jaw, absolutely. It's a lot harder to identify who did the biting. The victims were tiny creatures from 530 million years ago, just a few inches long, called trilobites. Something had taken a bite out of their side. Or had they? Where were the biters? The hunt was on. At stake was proof of one of the main pillars of evolution. The widely accepted theory that predation, animal attacks on others for food, is the most powerful force in evolution. Because it means that prey animals that don't develop defenses die out. Those that do live. Predation has driven a variety of traits from social behavior to the evolution of armor. You can see the coevolution and the escalation of this predator and prey interaction by the evolution of very thick shells as predation increased. But if predation was the driver of evolution in the Cambrian, who or what were the predators that attacked and fed on the trilobites. A break in the case came in 1981, when scientists pieced together four fossils, thought for 70 years to be four different animals, and theorized that they were, in fact, one giant Cambrian beast. The discovery of a complete fossil a year later proved the theory. They called it Anomalocaris, the strange shrimp. In the Cambrian seas, it was a monster. We're talking up to two meters in length, and compared to your average trilobite during the Cambrian, which might just be a few centimeters, they really would have dwarfed them. 
Geologist Bruce Lieberman presides over one of the biggest Cambrian fossil collections in the world at the University of Kansas. One treasure from the vault is this mouth part from Enomalocaris, showing clearly the world's earliest known form of a jaw. It's almost like one of those pineapple slices that you'd get in a can. It's sort of a circle, and inside there's a smaller circle where the hole for the mouth is. And around that inner circle, there are these little jagged things like teeth. The strange jaw couldn't close all the way, but it could tighten and clamp down like a nutcracker. Was it the biter? Lauren Babcock's team at the Ohio State University went looking for a match and found it. We discovered that the sizes and the shapes of the bite marks matched exactly the size and the shape of the mouth parts of anomalocaridids. The discovery was huge. It provided solid, direct evidence that the Cambrian time period was a time of kill and be killed, of evolve or die. So it's clear sort of smoking gun of a predator-prey interaction. And that's rare in the fossil record. And it's very important that it's from the Cambrian explosion. In response to Anomalocaris jaws, trilobites would evolve new defenses over time, possibly even including chemical weapons. We see, for example, the rise of greater spines or thickened spines, and maybe spines that held poison glands. And this is really the first clear and convincing evidence that predation was a driving force in evolution, even from the very beginning of the Paleozoic era. Anomalocaris had everything going for it. But after 10 million years on top, the beast disappears from the fossil record for reasons no one yet understands. While the horseshoe crab is a distant relative, the first killer jaw would have no descendants. Evolution is, in many instances, a battleground. I mean, let's face it, life is intense out there. Species have to constantly keep changing in order to prevent themselves from going extinct. It becomes uh, a matter of life and death, really, whether or not individuals can adapt in time to this constantly changing environment. Jaws would evolve again in a huge way, in a completely new line of animals, fish. It is 430 million years ago, and fish are the first animals to have a backbone, the first vertebrates. They are the ancestors of all vertebrates, including us, but they have no jaws, only openings too primitive to be called mouths. They feed by literally swimming into their food or by stirring up mud, counting and finding suspended particles for sustenance. But in one group of fish after another, a change occurs. Primitive fish have bony arches that hold up their gills, the fossil record suggests that over time, natural selection favored fish whose arches were set forward until they were able to grasp the food trying to wriggle away. The bottom arch swiveled. The top arch provided stability. It was a structural change that enabled survival and, with much variation, has persisted to this day in thousands of species, including our own. An extinct group of fish called placoderms were the first to develop jaws. This predatory edge made one of them the T-Rex of the seas. The exact nature of the beast's jaws has been a mystery until now. I'm standing next to Dunkelosteus torelli. 
It got up to 20 feet long and probably weighed a ton or more. And it was highly predatory. Mark Westney, zoologist at the Field Museum in Chicago, has been working to unravel the mysteries of Dunkleosteus. Why did its jaws grow so large? How did its strange toothless jaw operate? Dunkleosteus and, and other placoderms don't have teeth. They have a large bony lower jaw that has an enamel covering along the rim, and it is quite sharp at the tip. It's like a meat cleaver. Westneat believes the jaws grew so large and the blades so sharp to crush the hard outer shells of invertebrates that filled the oceans at this time. We think that it had a scissor-like action where the two plates would meet one another and slide past one another, much like a pair of scissors. Westneat devised an ingenious plan, combining several methods to decode the biochemanics of Dunk's bite. First, he used forensic reconstruction techniques to model Dunk's jaw and neck muscles, took measurements and calculated their power. This led Westneat and his team to a startling discovery. Dunk had muscles pulling both sides of its jaw up and back, Essentially, a perfect example of the modern engineering structure, the four-bar linkage, used to multiply force in everything from pruning shears to steam locomotive drivetrains. This two-muscle opening system rapidly opened the mouth hugely wide and slammed it shut just as fast. Intrigued. Westneat's team built a one-third scale model of the jaw to observe the bite in action. We simulate the muscle properties, the speed and force of contraction of these muscles using properties from modern day shark muscle. Many vertebrate muscles have very similar muscle properties, and so we think that's a reasonably accurate reconstruction of what was powering the Dunkleosteus skull. The final computer calculation stunned the team. Dunk's bite took just 70 milliseconds, creating an inrush of water and a bite force of 1,300 pounds. Dunk's bite fell like a guillotine, the most ferocious of any sea animal ever. The prey wouldn't stand a chance. But like Anomalocaris before, Dunk went extinct along with the scissor blade jaw. Its disappearance, another scientific mystery. Extinction is a very powerful creative force in evolution. Extinction will almost inevitably open up new niches that can then be colonized by other species. Dunk's niche as top predator would rapidly be filled by a creature that would succeed with a new kind of jaw, one that still hunts to this day, sharks. 350 million years ago, Dunkleosteus, the fish with the most powerful bite of all time, disappears from the fossil record. Soon, Sharks would rise to take Dunk's niche as top predator. Why did sharks survive and Dunk fail? The earliest sharks were probably lunch meat for Dunkleosteus. Sharks weren't always the top predator. Based on the fossil record, we believe that sharks have been around roughly 430 to 450 million years and they've been around longer than any other group of vertebrates on the planet today. Biologist Dan Huber's fascination with sharks started early. When I was about eight years old, a relative of mine was attacked by a shark while surfing off the east coast of Florida, and it just caused this tremendous curiosity in me, and I grew up hanging out by the shark tank at the New York Aquarium. In the hunt for clues to the shark's survival, Dan Huber set out to make the first detailed scientific measurements of the shark's bite. Instead of using a potentially dangerous live shark specimen, 
Huber got his hands on the head of a dead sand tiger shark that got tangled in a fishing line. His aim? Construct a precise virtual shark jaw inside the computer and study the bite from the safety of a desk chair. The first step to modeling the jaw is a high-resolution CT scan. Using these types of modeling techniques, we can actually get estimates of the maximum performance or maximum bite force of animals like sharks. The system produces a digital version of the shark's skull and an accurate foundation for the computer model. Next, Huber dissects his specimen, carefully measuring each muscle that powers the jaw. The muscle data is then overlaid onto the CT scan's skeletal blueprint, and together, bone and muscle form a complete 3D virtual jaw. The cyber shark is now ready for its virtual, numbers only, bite. When the numbers are crunched, they reveal a surprising fact. One thing that might surprise some people is that pound for pound, if we compare them to historical predators like Dunkleosteus, for example, they really don't bite all that hard. The shark's Huber modeled only produced bite forces of five to 600 pounds, less than half the power of Dunk. So if sharks can't dominate with biting power, why have they been so successful? For biologist Cheryl Wilga at the University of Rhode Island, the answers begin with a body built for speed. Think of a shark swimming really fast, chasing its prey. It has this nice hydrodynamic torpedo-shaped profile, which allows them to very quickly maneuver in any direction. Sharks have no bones to restrict their flow. They are built almost entirely of the kind of flexible cartilage we have in our nose. And the shark's jaw placement, neatly tucked low and back, reduces drag. Wilga's after the first microsecond analysis of how the shark bite works. She's studying a small, relatively docile shark called the spiny dogfish. To capture the lightning quick bite, Wilga sets up a special slow-motion video camera. And then the bait, a slice of herring. She took it. All right, head shaking, that's pretty good. A close-up examination of the video reveals the five-step shark bite, unique in all of nature. Wilga replays the five-part shark bite with a live and sedated dogfish. What you see when the shark is swimming is this nice, smooth profile here. And when he comes up to food, he elevates the cranium, he depresses the lower jaw, and then protrudes both the upper and the lower jaw away from the cranium. And when they're done feeding, everything goes back underneath the cranium, and there's a nice, smooth profile again. And all this happens in 50 to 70 milliseconds. The scientists call it jaw protrusion. It gives the shark a small but important advantage. You can equate this to, say, a sprint race. If the shark can thrust out its jaws just that much further to grab the prey, he's the winner by far. Just that little bit makes a huge difference. Sharks were fast. Shark jaws could reach out. And sharks evolved teeth perfectly suited to their task. Back in the day, sharks had small, tiny, ice pick-like teeth, more for grasping than anything else. But as several different groups evolved, teeth became bigger, but more importantly, it's the shape of the teeth. If you have a big triangle-shaped tooth that's serrated like a steak knife, it's easy to jab a, a steak knife into the prey. Razor-sharp shark's teeth also have evolved the amazing ability to regenerate throughout the fish's lifetime. And in fact, the teeth are so sharp that 
you generally have to wear some kind of heavy-duty glove in order to get close to them. And you can kind of see, as we open up the jaws, there's a teeth that are up front, and that's the row of teeth that they actually use to capture their food. But behind each of those functional teeth, there's six, seven, even eight teeth waiting to pop into place like a conveyor belt. So that as a shark captures its food and teeth can get ripped out, sharper teeth are ready to pop right into place so that they can keep on hunting without missing a beat. By any measure, one of the most successful life forms of all time, the shark has remained the top predator of the seas for over 300 million years, its jaws unmatched. But successful evolution is about the right tools for the right environment. A new kind of jaw would evolve when one lineage of fish took a bold step and moved onto dry land. 300 million years after sharks became the top predator of the seas, T-Rex was the top predator on land. But the T-Rex jaw was not descended from sharks at all. How did it happen? How did T-Rex get its bite? And how could one line of fish like these, with backbones and skeletons, but no bite to speak of, survive on land? So the early fish were living in shallow water. Competition was probably intense for food. If you can gain food in new ways, that's always an advantage. Harvard biologists Charles Marshall and Molly Markey study the strange transitional creatures that lived in shallow water 370 million years ago. They were fish, but they seemed to be on their way to becoming the world's first reptiles. They had fins with fin tails on them. They had gills. And then their fins started to take on structures that enable them to support their bodies on the bottom. And so it looks like they were beginning to locomote on the bottom using their proto-limbs. Marshall's research reveals that these limbed creatures, called tetrapods, evolved jaws that were also more reptile than fish. This computer simulation, based on fossil skull measurements, shows the early tetrapod jaw in action. They're biting, not sucking, which is really interesting. Fish, for the most part, suck. Because water is very viscous, it supports the food particles well. They open mouths rapidly, which pulls a column of water with the food in it into their mouths. It's possible these guys were acquiring food in a new way which required biting in the water. This basic life form combination, limbs, a skeleton, and a strong bite, set a successful pattern for many creatures to come, including us. Human beings still have the same form of jaw. 10 million years after they first emerged, tetrapods, having already evolved the biting jaw, were well suited to make the move on land. And once they made the move, their success was stunning. Fast forward 240 million years and thousands of species have inherited this new biting jaw. By the age of dinosaurs, survival is a bigger, faster, stronger game. Big jawed meat eaters on the offense, small jawed herbivores on defense, Carnivorous dinosaurs evolved better weapons for killing, more powerful jaws, teeth that were more effective for slicing through flesh, bigger claws, and so on. Herbivorous dinosaurs evolved defenses against carnivorous dinosaurs. Gigantic sizes, horns, spikes, or armor. In many ways, the age of dinosaurs can be thought of as an evolutionary arms race. T-Rex certainly looks like the most ferocious jawbiter of all time. A typical T-Rex jawbone is six feet long, stuffed with up to 50 long curved teeth at any one time. Like sharks, if those teeth broke off, T-Rex just grew them back. 
But a rising scientific theory says that T-Rex was really a wimp, whose arms were too short, legs were too slow, and eyes were too weak to bring down moving animals. A few paleontologists have argued that Tyrannosaurus rex was a scavenger rather than a hunter. These scientists envisioned Tyrannosaurus rex not as the fierce hunter that we all grew up with, but rather wandering across the landscape, sniffing out dead carcasses, something like a 10,000 pound vulture. Gregory Erickson is a paleobiologist and a champion of T-Rex. He is having none of it. Tyrannosaurus rex arguably was, was the most lethal terrestrial animal ever to have existed. You could easily bite through a bone like this. Erickson first became involved in the T-Rex debate in the 1990s, when as a graduate student, he analyzed this rare find, a triceratops pelvis riddled with exactly 58 bite marks. By matching casts of the indents to fossilized T-Rex teeth, he identified the biter as T-Rex. At first glance, the bite marks seemed to support the scavenger theory. T-Rex clearly took its time with this meal, nibbling the meat off the bone. But Erickson saw a chance to use the bite marks to establish a minimum bite force for T-Rex and to prove that T-Rex's teeth could do more than just scratch a bone. The teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex really stand out among dinosaur teeth. This animal had the largest teeth of any dinosaur. This is the root, this is the crown. So over half of this tooth was actually usable by this animal. So we have six inches of tooth that they could work with. And they had a very interesting profile to them. Reminiscent of, say, a steak knife or something like that. They even have the serrations on the front and the back. But this really isn't like a steak knife. If you look down at the end of the tooth, you see that it is much more rounded. It's shaped more like a railroad spike or a lethal banana even. Erickson had the teeth. He had the bite marks. Now Erickson set out to recreate, for the first time anywhere, the actual bite of T-Rex. There were hurdles to overcome. How big would a tooth be that made the marks? Which tooth was it? And the trickiest question, how could he build a meaningful replica of a T-Rex tooth? Erickson took T-Rex's reptile status as a clue. All reptile teeth are made of the same materials. They have an outer enamel shell, which is a really hard material. And inside that, the bulk of the tooth is dentine, which is a type of bone, essentially. And together, those two tissues act as a rigid body. Our replica here had to be as stiff and as hard as actual Tyrannosaur teeth. For the purposes of our experiment, we used bronze and aluminum. Bronze is a common casting material. And with the addition of aluminum, it made it a harder structure. So we had the size covered here. We also had the material properties. Erickson fixed his T-Rex tooth to a hydraulic press. His plan? To measure precisely how much power it would take to make the half-inch divot seen in the Triceratops bone. A modern cow pelvis stands in for the prey. The microstructure of cow pelvic bones are identical to the bones from Triceratops. All right, reset the display scope. Through trial and error, Zero force. Erickson adjusts the torque until he finds a precise match for the power of the real world bite. Actuator off. And running. Fire away. Fire. Punch straight through it, Paul. Oh. Man, you wouldn't want to get bitten by that. How much force, Paul? About 3,000 pounds. 3,000 pounds. Averaging many trials, Erickson's final result was 3,400 pounds of bite force, matching today's crocodiles for the most powerful jaws ever on Earth. And that's just a start. Probably both sides of the dentition were engaged when this animal was biting, too. So it's probably twice that much, which would put Tyrannosaurus as having bite forces at approximately twice that of uh, a large alligator today. It doesn't mean the Tyrannosaur was biting at full force. I suspect that Tyrannosaurus could generate bite forces perhaps three, four, five times greater. 
Erickson's work doesn't prove that T-Rex didn't occasionally scavenge, but it does show that this ferocious giant clearly had all the tools for the job of top predator. In the shadow of the dinosaurs, a different branch of the first creatures to crawl on land were evolving in their own way, with their own particular jaws and bite. When T-Rex and other big dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, the mammal's time had come, and their bite would be our bite. 65 million years ago, the dinosaur world order collapsed, most likely in the wake of a cataclysmic asteroid impact. Millions of species vanished from Earth in an event scientists call the Cretaceous Tertiary. KT, extinction. For tiny mammals, KT is the best thing that could have happened. Mammals had lived alongside dinosaurs for over 160 million years, but had almost always remained small. After the KT extinction, it was like an ecological release for mammals. Suddenly, they found themselves in a world with many open niches. And any time there's an open niche, some organism will evolve to exploit it. That's what mammals did, and that's why we're standing here today. The dinosaur's demise left room for a new top predator, and mammals, equipped with a new kind of jaw, would exploit the open niche. The key to their success was specialized teeth. But there's an important difference between the teeth of dinosaurs and the teeth of mammals. Dinosaur teeth are all peg-like, and they all look the same. Within a mouth, they just all look like a bunch of pegs. But mammal teeth look different in different parts of the mouth. Today, the mammal jaw has evolved to involve teeth that can extract the maximum amount of nutrition from many kinds of food. Incisors at the front for cutting and nibbling the food. Premolars set behind to tear it apart. Molars way at the back that compact against each other to grind the food down into digestible bits. And the killer teeth, the canines, named not for dogs, but for carnivora, the meat eaters. The canines are used to grab onto prey and hold them. So for obvious reasons, canines are much bigger in predatory mammals than they are in other animals. Now, the biggest canines that ever existed were on Smilodon, a saber-toothed cat. Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat, ruled the Americas from 3 million to 12,000 years ago. In the later part of its reign, this top predator most likely preyed on a physically unmatched newcomer to the scene, human beings. For scientists, Smilodon's strange and enormous 8-inch canines are a fascinating mystery. Why did these big cats evolve such extreme jaws? That's what anatomist Frank Mandel wanted to find out. Animals don't develop structures without presumably some use for them. And so the question is, what did they do with them that would make it worth evolving in this direction? Mandel devised the first ever practical experiment designed to answer the question, how did Smilodon kill? First, he headed to Texas for a study of Smilodon's relatives at a big cat sanctuary. These are the, the closest living analogs we have for Smilodon. Lions and tigers with three and a half inch canines are no saber tooths. But Mandel believes that their kill techniques will help him get closer to solving the mystery of Smilodon's bite. Modern day big cats bring down very large prey sometimes five, six times bigger than themselves. And they use their claws and teeth to pull themselves up until they can get a bite on the throat. And then they clamp down on the throat. Surprisingly, the lion's bite force is relatively mild. The lion's chokehold often does not even break the skin. Scientists assume the big cats are strangling their victims. But Mendel has a different idea. 
My concept is that they are squeezing on the arteries, which cause these animals to pass out in three to five seconds, applying a sleeper hold in effect. The cat must then hold that for three to five minutes to deprive the animal's brain of oxygen, and so the animal's now brain dead, and it won't fight with or give the cat any grief. One problem for the lion is that the scent of the five-minute kill alerts nearby scavengers to fresh food, courtesy of the lion. If you're there with a bunch of other predators, crocodiles, hyenas, other cats, then those animals will come, if they can, and take it. Smilodon's bite force is even less than the lion, so a five-minute death grip is unlikely. And evidence in the fossil record suggests these big teeth could break off in a protracted battle with enormous Ice Age prey. So how did Smilodon dominate life in the Americas for nearly three million years? Mendel is about to find out, bringing Smilodon's killer jaws to life. OK, we're going to take this articulator. A tractor stands in for Smilodon's beefy body. Get this up on the tractor here. And helps position the big cat's jaw correctly. The jaws were made from a cast from a real specimen. As a stand-in for one of Smilodon's large herbivorous prey, Mendel uses the carcass of a cow already earmarked as food for the big cats at the research facility. All the animals used here died of natural causes or were in critical condition and humanely euthanized. First, Mendel tests one prominent theory, which suggests that Smilodon might have chased down and eviscerated its prey with a disemboweling wound to the abdomen. So the first thing we want to do is align these teeth. Here's where we want to be on this animal's belly, right about here. There's no rib here. This is abdominal wall. So this is clearly a vulnerable area. Down. Keep coming. Keep coming. Smilodon could pivot its lower jaw down a very wide 110 degrees. But even then, the 8-inch canines would only have 3 inches of clearance. Would the clearance be enough to kill? If we can get a mouthful of skin, the canines don't actually make contact. They don't bury themselves in the belly wall at all. So this belly bite, for me at least, is a very uh, unattractive hypothesis. It seems a, a bit of a stretch. If the belly bite is out, what were the canines for? Mendel's theory goes straight for the jugular. Pretty nasty wound here. Why did the Ice Age predator Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat, evolve his eight-inch canines? Anatomist Frank Mendel is about to test his theory that the huge daggers helped the big cat go for the throat, even though their big teeth could not survive a protracted struggle. We've taken the articulator off the tractor, put it on the ground, and we've now placed it in front of the animal's neck. So in this case, the gate easily span the neck. No problem here. Uh, I think we're in a good position now to uh, drive these teeth. Go ahead, guys. We're applying some pressure here. And uh, there it goes. Oh, and we, we certainly got penetration here with the canines. Pretty nasty wound here. Big holes. Holes are not enough. Mendel checks to see if his replica Smilodon jaw cut any vital arteries for a quick kill. I'm going to make an incision between the bites, get through the skin. A lot of blood here. Oh, yeah, there is a hole right behind the airway, right where the carotids live. It's a, it's a very quick, penetrating wound. This animal would have died within seconds. Mendel believes his work explains the long-standing mystery of why Smilodon evolved such huge canines. Unlike lions, who need up to five minutes to kill their prey, Smilodon's eight-inch stilettos allowed them to kill and eat almost instantly, preventing scavengers from stealing their meal. Sabertooth cats 
I think they drove these teeth through the animal's neck, and the serrations on of these teeth cut one of those carotids. It would bleed out almost instantly and therefore kill it more quickly than the sleeper hold of modern day big cats. Smilodon became extinct at the end of the Ice Age 12,000 years ago, perhaps due to the sudden change of the climate, or perhaps because early human hunters outcompeted them for prey. As the new top predators, humans were fearsome, but their jaws were puny. How did humans succeed with jaws that are now so small? that even our primate cousins have bigger bites. Humans are anatomical wimps. Um, compared to a chimpanzee, we are, we are weaklings. Scott McGraw is an evolutionary anatomist who studies primates and the extinct relatives of humans, hominids. If you look at the great apes today, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans and bonobos. They're chewing, in many cases, tough, fibrous vegetation or hard fruits, requiring large, powerful jaws and, and jaw muscles. And if you look at the size of their teeth, you can see that the molars of these animals are larger than modern humans. Sometime around 1.8 million years ago, our hominid ancestors, who had been standing on two legs for some four million years, lost most of their body hair, grew their brains, and walked right out of Africa to spread across the world. Today, Homo sapiens, us, dominate all life on Earth. We did it with intelligence, not brute strength, and built tools that lessen the need for powerful jaws. During human evolution, there was clearly a transition from physical strength and the strength in biting, for example, to using our brains. Essentially, we were able to outwit our predators, and so there was a transfer of weaponry from the physical individual to the tools that that individual used. Through two million years of tool making, our jaws have shrunk dramatically as there was no need to sustain their enormous size. Our jaws are commonly no longer even big enough to house the wisdom teeth that grow in young adults. In the future, scientists theorize wisdom teeth may disappear altogether. Our teeth have shrunk, our jaws have shrunk, our chewing muscles have shrunk, and that has to do with our relaxed diet. We can just shove something in the microwave. We don't need to have big, robust teeth and jaws and muscles to process our food. We don't even need teeth, just a straw. For half a billion years, many top predators have had the strongest bite in their environment. Today, it earns them a place in the zoo. But 400 million years of evolution proves that the only constant is change. The thing that's exciting about evolution is that at every generation, the rules are slightly different than they were for the generation before. So sometimes the strategy that you have in place now isn't necessarily gonna work in the future. Perhaps we humans should not get too comfortable with our place on top. Uh, changes the playing field altogether. What it means is that you're not limited to feeding on things that already fit in your mouth. Such a, a great asset that the vertebrates with jaws outcompeted everything else. In the history of the vertebrates, there's probably nothing quite as important as the evolution of a jaw. Jaws are everywhere. But once there were no jaws at all. How could one anatomical feature, a simple muscled hinge, drive so much of evolution, literally shaping many animals we see today? 
the answers begin with the first bite. In 1979, these fossils were identified as evidence of the world's first known jaws attack. This is the first bite mark produced by a jaw, absolutely. It's a lot harder to identify who did the biting. The victims were tiny creatures from 530 million years ago, just a few inches long, called trilobites. Something had taken a bite out of their side. Or had they? Where were the biters? The hunt was on. At stake was proof of one of the main pillars of evolution. The widely accepted theory that predation, animal attacks on including chemical weapons. We see, for example, the rise of greater spines or thickened spines, and maybe spines that held poison glands. And this is really the first clear and convincing evidence that predation was a driving force in evolution, even from the very beginning of the Paleozoic era. Anomalocaris had everything going for it. But after 10 million years on top, the beast disappears from the fossil record for reasons no one yet understands. While the horseshoe crab is a distant relative, the first killer jaw would have no descendants. Evolution is, in many instances, a battleground. I mean, let's face it, life is intense out there. Species have to constantly keep changing in order to prevent themselves from going extinct. It becomes uh, a matter of life and death, really, whether or not individuals can adapt in time to this constantly changing environment. Jaws would evolve again in a huge way, in a completely new line of animals, fish. It is 430 million years ago, and fish are the first animals to have a backbone, the first vertebrates. They are the ancestors of all vertebrates, including us, but they have no jaws, only openings too primitive. For 400 million years, every top predator has needed the same fearsome piece of equipment, a wicked set of jaws. Out of life's endless struggle, predators evolve, defenses evolve in response, and ferocious top predators evolve again. It's a vicious story of kill and be killed, of escape and capture, the story of Jaws. powerful set of jaws today belongs to the Crocodilia order, which includes crocodiles and alligators. Their fearsome bite snap shut with 3,000 pounds of bite force power. On the 1 8 inch point of the sharpest front tooth, 24,000 pounds per square inch, twice as much power as the average nail gun. The crocodile can feed on animals as large as water buffalo and wildebeest. For millions of years, crocodiles and every creature with a powerful jaw has held a huge advantage in the struggle for survival. The presence of a jaw. Others for food is the most powerful force in evolution because it means that prey animals that don't develop defenses die out. Those that do live. Predation has driven a variety of traits from social behavior to the evolution of armor. You can see the coevolution and the escalation of this predator and prey interaction by the evolution of very thick shells 
as predation increased. But if predation was the driver of evolution in the Cambrian, who or what were the predators that attacked and fed on the trilobites? A break in the case came in 1981, when scientists pieced together four fossils, thought for 70 years to be four different animals, and theorized that they were, in fact, one giant Cambrian beast. The discovery of a complete fossil a year later proved the theory. They called it Anomalocaris, the strange shrimp. In the Cambrian seas, it was a monster. We're talking up to two meters in length, and compared to your average trilobite during the Cambrian, which might just be a few centimeters, they really would have dwarfed them. Geologist Bruce Lieberman presides over one of the biggest Cambrian fossil collections in the world at the University of Kansas. One treasure from the vault is this mouth part from Anomalocaris, showing clearly the world's earliest known form of a jaw. It's almost like one of those pineapple slices that you'd get in a can. It's sort of a circle. And inside, there's a smaller circle where the hole for the mouth is. And around that inner circle, there are these little jagged things like teeth. The strange jaw couldn't close all the way, but it could tighten and clamp down like a nutcracker. Was it the biter? Lauren Babcock's team at The Ohio State University went looking for a match and found it. We discovered that the sizes and the shapes of the bite marks matched exactly the size and the shape of the mouth parts of anomaly caridids. The discovery was huge. It provided solid, direct evidence that the Cambrian time period was a time of kill and be killed, of evolve or die. So it's clear sort of smoking gun of a predator-prey interaction. And that's rare in the fossil record. And it's very important that it's from the Cambrian explosion. In response to Anomalocaris jaws, trilobites would evolve new defenses over time, possibly even